Well, welcome everybody. Um, we're here today for the Nuclear Mixer. I think this is our second of the 2021 season, so we're delighted you could all join us. I'm Letha Filderman from PopTech. And I'm Sara Kachesvahani from N-Square. And uh, today we have a, a, a light conversation, the, the climate nuclear nexus. Um, you know, so I do hope in the spirit of happy hour, those of you who would like a, a refreshment of the happy hour type can grab one before we get started. Um, but needless to say, to, these are two existential threats that pose probably the gravest threat to human civilization, not to mention all other uh, species on the planet. And we believe by exploring these common threats and, and issues in tandem, we have a, a high probability of making some better progress against them than we may by exploring them separately. And we're so honored to have these two excellent speakers with us today. And as Lisa mentioned, where better than a happy hour to discuss these existential <laughs> crises, right? Um, we have Dr. Emma Belcher, the president of the Plowshares Fund, who's gonna tackle the easy part as far as nuclear weapons are concerned. And then we'll hear from David Gelber, the co-founder and chairman of the Years Project, who's going to tackle the easy, uh, equally easy issue of climate change. So we're going to hear a little bit from David and Emma, and then like what we do as we normally do, we're going to put you all to work. We'll send you into breakout rooms for about 10 minutes, where hopefully you'll meet with new people, new acquaintances. And here is where you get the opportunity to participate, to connect, to contribute, and then reflect. After the breakout session, we'll come back and reconvene as a larger group and we'll do a readout, a discussion, a question and answer with our great speakers before we wrap up promptly at 5.30 Eastern time. Um, on behalf of Lisa and myself, thank you so much for coming. Thank you to Lisa, my co-host. Thank you to Brittany and the, and the wonderful team at Tech Change for producing this event. And of course, thank you to Emma, Emma and to David. So cheers to all of you. And so, Emma, I will hand it over to you. Thanks so much. Cheers, Sarah. Um, and um, uh, welcome, everybody, to uh, this happy hour. Um, I'm in Melbourne, Australia at the moment. We're at 6.30 a.m., so I won't be joining you for a, um, a, hard, uh, a hard drink. Um, I just made myself a cup of tea and accidentally... Um, uh, put espresso water in the with the tea bag. So um, I think I clearly need more coffee rather than any alcohol in my beverage. Um, but in any case, uh, it's wonderful to be here with you um, and looking forward to this uh, conversation. And Lita asked me just to speak a little bit about the sort of symbiotic relationship between nuclear and climate, um, and then to talk a little bit about um, some of the hurdles and obstacles to um, progressive uh, nuclear policy. So I'll jump right into that now and then hand it over to David to get us uh, going on the climate side. So really clearly there's a very clear symbiotic relationship between nuclear and climate. And one is really in the nature of the threats that Letha has already uh, pointed out, they're existential. Although I have to admit that there's probably a certain amount of existential threat awareness envy um, on the part of the uh, nuclear community with climate, with nuclear having really receded from the public consciousness since the end of the Cold War um, and much more awareness being given to, to climate. Yet it's all relative, right? And so I think while we in the nuclear community feel frustrated that we're not getting more attention and potentially more um, money to do the work that we want to be doing, um, I think equally that's probably um, how a number of people in the climate movement feel that because of the nature of the threat and its importance, um, it really should be getting more attention and more and more money to try and solve these problems. In anyhow, I think we clearly have things here that are both existential in nature. We've got the sort of slow boiling frog versus the frog that might be shot out of the water at any point. And so clearly we've got sort of a shared interest in thinking about the kind of world that we all want to live in that is safe and secure and uh, prosperous for everybody. Um, so there's, there's that aspect, but there's also the sort of interesting relationship between nuclear technology and climate change. And this is something that I think we can really get into um, in our conversation here. And, you know, I think more and more people in the climate movement are coming to think that um, nuclear power is really an inevitable part of the, the um, 
energy mix that needs to go toward contributing to um, preventing climate change and tackling climate change. And, you know, I think this is something that really people didn't really touch for a while. And there's a lot of emotion involved um, and a lot of strong points of view that people have about nuclear power. And um, I think there's more and more recognition now um, that this needs to be a conversation that we need to have. Um, how can use of nuclear power contribute to achieving climate goals? But really there are questions of how much of a panacea can nuclear technology really be? What are the dangers in investing in nuclear technology? And how does that intersect with the potential for uh, weapons proliferation? Um, and um, there are some really thorny, interesting policy questions here. And I think that, um, you know, we've seen more recently um, growing debate and growing interest in people trying to tackle this intersection between nuclear and climate change. But I think what we've had in the past is a lot of people talking past each other and a lack of shared sort of data points for everybody to be talking about this issue um, with the same kind of information at hand. There's not really agreement about that. Um, and I think that, you know, this is a really important discussion to have. It strikes me something that many on this call could contribute to. Um, you know, what is the role of nuclear power in addressing climate change, if any? Um, and uh, how much risk are we willing to take with using te nuclear technology? Um, so that's sort of another uh, angle there. But then there's a third angle that I want to raise on the sort of connection and the similarities between climate and nuclear. And that's the harms that are caused um, by both climate change and nuclear weapons um, that tend to affect marginalised and vulnerable communities. So, you know, we see on the nuclear front um, the, the communities that have been harmed by the existence of nuclear weapons. So by the uranium mining and by the weapons testing decades ago um, and that poor health outcomes that we see in people who live in those areas. Also the environmental degradation, which is different to climate change, of course, but thinking about, um, you know, the waste and where that is stored and how that, um, you know, potentially affects people living in those areas. Um, and, you know, similarly, and I'm sure David can talk to this much more eloquently than I could, um, you know, when you're looking at climate change and the effect of climate change, um, different kind of catastrophic events, um, be there be floods, fire, all the rest, um, of course, they can strike in any place, but the ability of people to be resilient to these events, um, to be able to um, survive them and have the resources to be able to um, adapt, really, it strikes me that the people most affected, uh, particularly vulnerable and marginalised people who maybe don't have um, the kind of support or the resources to, to, to withstand them. So I think, you know, that's a third angle on the connection and it's something for us to explore um, here today. And Letha did ask me, also ask me to talk briefly about the hurdles and opportunities to progressive nuclear policy change. And I think we're in a very interesting moment. Um, you know, we have thankfully a new president, uh, one who's uh, we're not so concerned about having the uh, access to the nuclear codes. Um, but I think there's also, you know, a tendency for us to assume that just because we have a new administration, we have a Democrat president who's more likely in line with nuclear policy, um, at least from our perspective, and that mm. we'll be able to sort of get what we want. And I think, yes, it is better that we have a Biden administration, but in terms of progressive nuclear policy change, um, really it's unlikely that Biden will go as far as a lot of people uh, in the community would like. Um, I think we can be looking to the future um, for seeing more people with a more progressive nuclear policy mindset coming up through the ranks as well as uh, filling out some of the positions in future administrations that might lead to um, sort of mo more progress in the way that we'd like, um, but we're not there quite yet. So um, we're seeing this, I think, very clearly with the fact that a lot of us in the, this community thought we'd get right back into the Iran nuclear deal. And we've seen that the Biden administration has dragged its feet and we're seeing domestic politics coming into play here. Um, and so, you know, they're kind of part of the challenges I think we're seeing. Mm. Um, I also think that... Um, uh, 
you know, we've had challenges in the past with having to focus so closely um, on the threats that have come to us on a daily basis almost from the Trump administration, trying to hold the line, prevent bad things from coming worse, that we've been very focused on incremental gains. Um, but I think the good news, and I'll end with this, is that we have an opportunity now. We have a new administration. We're not so distracted by focusing on reacting and responding to the Trump administration. We've got an opportunity to invest in longer term thinking. The distraction of the Trump administration is gone. And we're seeing a groundswell of people interested in creating a better world. We're seeing people with different perspectives, people focusing on different issues like climate, like racial justice, all interested in challenging the status quo, looking at questions of power and money and politics, issues of representation, democracy and governance. And I get the sense that there's a groundswell of people all wanting a more safe world that is more just. And so I think now we've got an opportunity to partner with each other and think about what are our shared goals? How can we work with each other, um, showing up for each other, not just trying to break through the noise on, on our individual issues? So with that, I'll throw over to David and get his thoughts on um, other sort of connections between nuclear and climate and, and what we can learn from each other. Thanks, David. Thanks, Emma. Um, well, first of all, let me just tell you briefly that I'm, I'm not a climate scientist. Um, I am a journalist and, and spent 25 years as a producer at 60 Minutes and left 60 Minutes about 10 years ago to, uh, to start the year's project, which has done a series of documentaries on climate and continues to do that today. Um, and, you know, it, it's, um, you, you raised the issue of the, the difference in focus and the, in the uh, public's attention to nuclear issues and to climate issues. And it's certainly true that we act as if the nuclear danger has disappeared and we know that it really hasn't. Um, but in the 10 years that I, and I have to confess, and I think it's dangerous to confess it to this crowd because I've seen what you guys do. Uh, I've spent 10 years uh, thinking about climate and maybe less than a day thinking about the, about the nuclear uh, crisis. Um, and so let me, let me, and, and of course, we, we're now in the midst of um, really a growing grassroots movement. I mean, a large grassroots movement on climate. And there's good news and there's bad news associated with that. Let me let me tell you a little bit about the good news first. Um, a, uh, a research group connected to a major university uh, has divided the American public into different categories of concern over climate. Um, the alarmed group is the, is the one that... Uh, is most involved, most concerned about climate. Uh, and that group has grown incredibly over the last couple of years. Uh, it used to be that there were as many uh, dismissives as there were alarmed, and, and that no longer is true. There, there are, in fact, uh, this group released a, a number the other day that, that there are 50 million Americans who consider themselves alarmed about climate. And even more surprising to me is that 16, about one third of that group, said that they are prepared to engage in nonviolent civil disobedience uh, around climate. Um, and you know, it's, it's, um, it's not entirely uh, surprising why this growth has taken place. I mean, it's very hard to ignore the chemistry and the physics of climate. I mean, there are more and more catastrophes happening, more and more people are touched by it, even um, uh, folks in the in the financial industry, uh, many of them are in fact adversely affected by what's happening in climate. So, um, in addition to them, obviously, ordinary folks in places like you know California, Staten Island, Honduras uh, have had direct relations with uh, a relationship with uh, uh, climate catastrophes, and even more are will be affected by that in the future by those catastrophes in the future. Um, so, uh, and I have to admit that, uh, Emma, that I, I don't understand how nuclear can become a grassroot, an issue that will capture the imagination of millions of people the way climate has in the absence of a nuclear catastrophe. And I'd be very interested in hearing, you know, later uh, how you think that could happen. So let me get back to the bad news on climate. Um, the bad news is that coal and coal use in India and China is, is rising. Uh, we're not on track to stop this. Um, we're, we're really consigning people to a level of suffering far greater than what 
they're experiencing now with the coronavirus, and not just because of the climate catastrophes. Um, you, you may be aware that because of the pollution that results from, uh, from greenhouse gas emissions, 10,000 people a day are dying. Every year, 8.7 million people, that is to say the population of London or, or New York, um, dies as a result of climate pollution. Forget the catastrophes for a second. Um, and as somebody put it, uh, hell is already here. Uh, it's just distributed unequally. Uh, some people uh, experience it, others not so much. Um, but that's likely to um, become even worse. And, and the thing is, is that our political system is still, in spite of the fact that we've got all these folks who care about climate and consider themselves uh, in the alarm category, our political system is not dealing with this yet. Our economic system is, is as we speak, leading to, uh, to unchecked climate change, um, which means more and more deaths, more pestilence, more famine, and more destruction of our biosphere. Um, and so um, things may change on that front, right? I mean, we have an administration now that says they want to do something about it, but even if they do what they say they're gonna do. I'm talking about the Biden administration. It's very unlikely to be nearly um, enough to get us to where the scientists say we have to be. The scientists or climate scientists or the IPCC are telling us that, that we need to, if we if we're to maintain a 1.5 degree rise in temperature, if we could cap it at 1.5 degree centigrade, we have to eliminate 50% of all of our CO2 emissions by 2030. Um, and uh, that is um, uh, that is extremely unlikely, uh, given given the path that we're on right now. So I wanted to spend a minute talking about uh, a book that I just finished this week uh, that some of you may be familiar with. A book called the, Minis the Ministry for the Future by a science fiction novelist named Kim Stanley Robinson, which is the most interesting projection of where we might be. It's actually rather optimistic, um, uh, but it begins with, and, and I wanna pose this as a kind of a, a question that affects both nuclear and climate issues. Uh, the book begins with a catastrophe, with a, a so-called wet bulb catastrophe in which 20 million Indians die because of a heat wave, because of a catastrophic heat wave combining uh, heat and humidity. And the truth of the matter is that we're not that far from something like that actually happening. So here's the hypothetical. Let's say that we get to 2030 and that, heat, and that catastrophe, that 20 million uh, death catastrophe happens in 2030. And the Indians look around and see that uh, 15 years before in 2015, the, the, the nations of the world, the main nations, the, uh, most of Europe, the US, China, um, uh, Russia, uh, signed a treaty promising to uh, limit, to, 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 to cut climate uh, emissions, uh, G, uh, greenhouse gas emissions in half by 2030. And the Indians who have just suffered this catastrophe of 20 million people dying, um, uh, look at around and see that, uh, that, that these countries have not kept their promise. They have not done that because we're almost certainly not going to do it by 2030 the way we're going now. And guess what? the Indians have a nuclear weapon. Um, so what do you think that, that leads to? I mean, I won't answer that question because who knows, right? But, but you can see all kinds of possible outcomes and maybe uh, I can leave my remarks there and let us think about what could happen uh, should that, uh, that kind of future occur. This is captivating, and I want to thank both of you because I think what you do here is you open up a lot of of areas for conversation among the group that's here today, which is, is a remarkable group, by the way, we're delighted everybody's with us. You know, but what comes out in this conversation? I mean, there's this thing, you know, because I spend more of my time in the nuclear camp than the climate camp of like envy, like, wow, look at those climate people have, you know, all these, this energy during the election cycle, CNN did a whole town hall discussing this and then, you know, what 15 minutes were spent in, in the presidential debates talking about nuclear. Um, you know, so there seems to be a lopsidedness and obviously around public engagement, it's, it's substantial. 
Um, you know, yet these these issues have so much in common when it comes to the threat. You know, if if as you say, David, climate catastrophes create instability, that actually potens potentiates the the use of a potential nuclear weapon in areas where there is instability. So I want to talk a little bit about what are the pathways maybe, and maybe we can have everybody discuss this in their breakout groups of, of how we try to bring these two issues closer together with the hope of collaborating to find better solutions? Well, I mean, I'll just, I'll just say that the, you know, I think that uh, in the speaking on the climate side of things, um, the, the de-siloizing of, of issues has been something that we've been very focused on uh, over the last couple of years, especially, and I think we've actually achieved some real progress on this, especially with respect to issues of inequality, um, who gets hurt the most. Um, and we're seeing the sort of evolution of the climate movement from something that was essentially middle-class and white to something that is far more diverse right now. I haven't seen a lot of evidence that we are moving in, a, in that kind of direction with the nuclear um, movement. Have, uh, have you, Emma? I mean, do you, do you see any progress in this? In yeah, this I mean, I think you, you, you're right, David. This is exactly what, <clears throat> excuse me, we have to do. And one thing that struck me as you were asking how we get nuclear to more public awareness, I was about to say, well, one easy way would be if there's a nuclear catastrophe, which you then said, right. you know, without having that, ideally, we don't want to have to have that uh, in order to, to um, get us into to gear. I do see that there are um, that what you've described in terms of the um, climate community breaking down silos, um, really connecting with other kind of issue areas is something that is happening in the nuclear field now. It's at the sort of more nascent level, and I really actually just want to shout out um, to to uh, Letha at Poptech and Sarah at N Square for the efforts that I think um, you both have done and your organisations in bringing people together. And part of it is having these kinds of discussions and bringing people together to talk about this. I do see that we're seeing particular um, uh, resonance in some of our issues when we focus on inequality and justice. And when we look at not only the harms that people experience by the existence of nuclear weapons, as I mentioned, but also when we look at these sort of, you know, white supremacist policies or that the, the construct that nuclear weapons are, there are sort of colonial um, overtones here, actually, um, you know, when thinking about the countries that are allowed to have nuclear weapons versus those who aren't allowed to or who may be seen as not being responsible enough to have nuclear weapons. In the targeting policy of what countries are targeted for um, uh, nuclear strikes and where nuclear weapons have been used in the past. And I think as we start to surface some of those issues, we see the connection between some of the issues that are really on people's mind right now with respect to racial justice, equality um, and representation and voice. And we're seeing in the, the nuclear area, nuclear is one expression of violence and violence that is sort of, it's the, an ultimate expression of violence. But we see where there are connections all the way down to the domestic and local levels with some of the issues that are really gaining traction now about, you know, the use of violence, the use of the police, the use of military, militarization of um, foreign policy. So I think these are really important threads to pull on. And I see um, a lot of willingness of people to do that. And I'm just thrilled to see the types of people who are now engaging and coming to this nuclear issue because we're, we're trying to open up and break down those silos. So I think there's more of that. It's happening, but we need to be doing more. You know, in, in reading to prepare for our session today, it was interesting to me, one of the papers I was looking at, looked at climate as being sort of on the offense on, on issues um, and particularly in interactions with polit political people uh, and nuclear perceived as being on the defense. Um, you know, so that's another juxtaposition that is there, is that real? And is there a way to, to sort of even the curves out? Well, I don't know that I would uh, accept that entirely. I don't know that, that in terms of nuclear, but uh, the idea that we're on the offense, we are up against a huge, huge enemy. Um, I mean, there is a powerful institution, a set of institutions in this country and in the world uh, that want to slow things down 
And, you know, the, the issue isn't so much that they're climate deniers anymore, they're climate delayers. I mean, they're, uh, so what we hear is that it's gonna cost jobs, it's gonna cost, um, you know, it's gonna ruin the economy to do something about clean energy, to bring in more clean energy. And by the way, I am an advocate of nuclear, nuclear energy. I don't think we can possibly get to where we need to go without nuclear energy. And in fact, I would even argue that given the numbers that I cited before, about the people, about the, the 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 people who died just because of pollution of, of uh, greenhouse gas pollution, that you could stipulate one Fukushima every twenty years, and you'd still be way better off to uh, to um, to get rid of fossil fuels. But anyway, I'm getting off the point. So we, we don't feel as if we're on the offense. We feel as if we are fighting a very powerful, extremely well-funded agency with. Advert with, uh, with, with major Madison Avenue support, with major political support, they own part of Congress. Um, and to make the argument that it is in the public interest to actually take on climate uh, is not an easy task. I mean, it's gonna be very difficult for, um, for the Biden administration to pull this off politically. And Emma, do you I wanna to speak to the defense side? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think we have been on the de defence definitely with nuclear in terms of the Trump administration, but I think we're still on the defence with the Biden administration um, because there's a certain sense that um, uh, there's a status quo in much the way that uh, David was talking about. Very powerful um, people who are very um, in favour because they benefit financially from nuclear weapons and the nuclear uh, industrial complex. Um, so I think we're, you know, we're talking about money. We're talking about money in politics. We're talking about um, jobs and, and trying to be able to make the arguments to um, the administration, but members of Congress and local constituents about why nuclear weapons um, aren't in their long-term interests and how, if you... Um, divested um, from nuclear weapons, you know, what could you put in place? And I think there's some really interesting work being done looking in particular at, you know, how could you take jobs that are maybe proposed through certain nuclear weapons programs and turn them into jobs that help the green economy? Um, you know, there's sort of an interesting idea there, but I think what we're coming to see is we've got to look at this at a very practical level. How do we identify those who stand to benefit from the status quo um, and identify um, uh, windows of opportunity and places to push where we can provide alternative options for people. Fabulous. Well, we're just about to head to the breakout rooms and um, David and Emma, do you, would you like to give anybody a, a prompt or a, a call to action here for the, the breakout rooms? And then we're gonna all come back together um, after about 10, 12 minutes. Mm. Um, I'll, I'll start off with a prompt that relates a bit to what David just said. Um, you know, think about, are you in favour of nuclear power to address climate change? If you are, would you be wanting to live downwind from nuclear power plants? And um, if you're not in favour of nuclear power to address climate concerns, how will you reconcile with your conscience um, uh, the death of, you know, 20 million people in India? Um, through some climate event. Um, I don't mean to suggest I'm in favour of one or the other here. It's just a, a kind of a prompt mm. for people to think about. That's a good one. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Uh, Lisa, I think we, we have everyone if we want to get started with Q&A. Yeah, so um, usually what we do, again, these are pretty interactive, and I'm actually going to turn it over to Sara, who's the master of, like, informing us how to uh, proceed at this point. So, Sarah. Thank you, Lisa. Well, I guess at this point we can either do, which I hate doing as a professor, pick on people to ask, if, to share some insights, or if there are any burning questions, we would ask you to kind of raise your hand and then Brittany will like call on you and you can like raise your question. I know there's been some questions in the chat before we kind of broke out. So while some of you might be waiting to kind of use your raise hand function, which I believe you can find at the bottom of your screen, we can maybe kind of start with the questions. But I see uh, Ira has raised his hand. So maybe we'll start with you, Ira, and then I'll hand it over to you, Brittany, to kind of moderate the flow of the Q&A. Thank you. Uh, kind of a, a comment question uh, about the observation made uh, in the presentations that, that it would be difficult to build a movement around nuclear, the nuclear issue at this point. 
Um, and uh, I think the opinion was offered that it, it can't be done uh, uh, in the way that it has around, around climate. Um, I'm not sure how to do it, but I know that it can be done because it, it has been done. Uh, we had an enormous movement around nuclear issues without a nuclear war or in, without a nuclear disaster back in the 1980s. Um, the impetus for that seemed to be a broad understanding that nuclear war could actually happen and that if it did, it would be utterly catastrophic. The experts are telling us today that the danger of nuclear war is greater now than it was in the 1980s. William Perry, the former Secretary of Defense, the um, panel of experts at the Bull and the Atomic Scientists. So the question is that I would pose to this group is, given this, how do we get that message out to the public that nuclear war can happen, that it will be unbelievably catastrophic, and that we need to focus on the elimination of these weapons because we now understand that everything that we've done up until now um, has not gotten rid of the danger. Yeah, thanks, Ira. I think, um, uh, you know, I also don't want to suggest that I don't think we can break through. I think we can break through and that's why I'm working on this. <laughs> um, and um, But I do think it's going to be different breaking through in the way that it was um, back in the 80s with a sort of a mass movement focused solely on nuclear. I think we need to be able to um, partner with others to look at the kind of world that we want to see and all the threats that are um, uh, going to get in the way of a safe and peaceful world for all. Um, and I think by coming to people, by making clear the intersection between nuclear and their issue areas that they're interested in. So as we were talking about racial justice, climate, um, you know, the economy, um, healthcare, um, we need to sort of come to people and make those connections clear. And then once we've made those connections, try to get the message out about how devastating um, nuclear would be. Because just I think what we've seen in the past is that just saying that, um, isn't necessarily breaking through. We need to figure out how to make it seem really real to people and more proximate. And I think, you know, Elizabeth Talman at Nucleus has done a lot of work on this about um, making those connections and um, how that can be a better way than just trying to tell people. We do know that um, people can often be turned off because it seems far too um, scary. It's very abstract and it's hard to know what you can do about it. So I think you know, what we're seeing is that's probably the best way to try and make progress on this area is to is to join with others. But I'd love to hear um, additional thoughts. Excellent. Um, other questions or comments? Uh, hi, I'm Bob Gould. I'm sorry I joined very late and missed the discussion up front, but caught up a little bit in our breakout session. I work with our on the uh, PSR and IPPNW boards. I would, I would just say, you know, I, I think the nuclear weapons issues remain extremely important and we have to keep putting it out. Uh, many of our students just haven't heard about it compared to the other issues that really motivate them. But I feel just, you know, from my own experience with uh, students at medical uh, health professional students at uh, UCSF and at uh, Stanford that it is indeed what you were just saying, Emma, I would agree 100% with you in terms of the importance of connecting with the issues and, and those connections have to be, and I, and I would agree also in terms of if we're looking at a, uh, speaking personally as a theory of social change that we, we need to have that type of movement and it has to be broad. So it is finding the balance that we don't want to neglect what is this major existential issue, but unless just in terms of connecting with consciousness, we have to move with people and what their motivations are now in general, I, I'd support that. Thanks, Robert. So Frank, if you want to share, and then again, feel free to post questions in the chat or use that phrase hand feature. Okay, uh, well, I, I'll, I'll just, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, what Ira said and what Emma said about the, um, the, the ability to galvanize uh, a, a movement on nuclear weapons issues again. And in the, in the 1980s, I, I think there was a perception that on both sides, uh, both the Soviet and the US sides, that, the, that we were, um, you know, the, that the other side thought it could fight and win a nuclear war. 
and that was really scary. And and was driving the arms race. And I mean, it, it wasn't true, uh, but but that was that was what brought people out in the streets. Uh, the situation, I think, which which is more accurate uh, and, and and is certainly true today, is is. Uh, the possibility of accidental nuclear war, un, un, unintended nuclear war, and uh, and and there we have it's a probabilistic thing, and uh, maybe the chances of us blowing up civilization is one percent a year. Whereas with with climate, if we keep going the way we are, we'll, we'll wreck wreck the um, the planet with a hundred percent probability. So it it it, it it's like the um, you know, I, I think about it like Fukushima, you know, where, where people, uh, Tefco said, well, there's no hurry to do anything about protecting against a tsunami because uh, a tsunami hasn't happened here for a thousand years. And of course it had been happened, it was about a thousand years and the interval was about a thousand years. <laughs> so they didn't look up, just a comment. Thanks, Frank. I see Marjana, you've raised your hand. Do you have a question for um, David? No, I just uh, had a couple of comments. I think actually this is a good time to kind of revitalize the movement against nuclear power. Uh, one reason is that we are in a pandemic. So the resources where the budget goes, and somebody mentioned that also in the chat, uh, you know, the money instead of at least in US, instead of going to Pentagon should go into developing vaccines and you know, public health issues. The other issue is that as uh, other people alluded to, environmental movement now is gathering a lot of momentum. And uh, for some of us who are not in favor of using nuclear power uh, as a solution for uh, you know, uh, global warming, I think uh, that's educating the public about the dangers of nuclear power, about uh, how the waste is actually uh, stored in, um, uh, environmental justice communities. I think those are all uh, issues that are hot topics right now. Um, uh, so, so those are, I, I think it's actually a good time to revitalize the movement. No, thank you. I don't know, Emma, David, did either of you want to comment on any of the other comments we've seen over the past few speakers? You know, I, I, I just wanted to, to uh, ask Emma, um, you've been working on this for a while. And I just, um, would love to know your own your own personal experiences of, of actually trying to mobilize a, a, a nuclear movement. I mean, uh, to just be as personal as you can be about it. I mean, what, what what's been your experience? Yeah, um, great question, actually. And I think um, one of the the instructive part of my answer, I think, is going to be that I probably haven't spent a lot of time trying to get a nuclear movement going. And I'm increasingly of the view that that's what has been missing and that that's why part of the reason why we're in the position we're in now. I mean, I think we're clearly up against vested interests, but I think in terms of trying to tackle the problem as a community, we've been very focused on, you know, the insider game and the specifics policies and trying to get decision makers to change their mind on specific things. And we haven't provided the environment to create pressure for policymakers to make the right decisions. And part of that, I think, has been because it's really hard to think about how we would do that and how do we have enough resources to be able to do that. So as a small community, we've tried to really focus where we think we can have the greatest impact. And I think what we're seeing now is that we can have impact, but it can be incremental. And I think the only way to get beyond incremental impact and to end up in a better place in 10, 20, 30 years is to try to create this kind of greater public awareness and public pressure. And this relates to some of the questions and comments that I see in the chat about, you know, and, and the fact that now is a time where people are focused on where are our priorities and, you know, how should we be spending and allocating our precious resources as a society, as a country and as the globe um, on what really makes us safe. And I think, you know, we see the fact that we're spending so much money on nuclear weapons and whereas a fraction of that money could be really used to be put to much greater effect to for prevention um, of pandemics, preparedness and, and all the rest. 
And just trying to make these trade-offs right now, you know, nuclear weapons and the budget seems prime for, you know, picking it off as something that doesn't keep us safe, that introduces more danger and where money could be spent better. And I think, you know, you know, I'd like to kind of elevate Elizabeth Talman's point about, you know, her observation that we need to change the narrative from one being something about sort of, I think, more of the, the, the weapons and the things to something that centres humans in this and to look at, look at what are the impacts here for human beings and to make it much more relatable. So I think what I'd love to see is I don't think we should stop playing the inside game. We need analysis and expertise and the right kind of advice about policy decisions. But we need something else and we need um, much more mass awareness and pressure. And I think the moment is ripe for us to do that now. Um, so as we're kind of looking to who are our partners, how do we work with them? Um, we need to make sure we're as attractive a field as possible. Um, we need to make sure we're as modern as possible and we're as um, diverse as possible. So we're really representing and reaching those people um, that we need to reach to gather steam behind, behind this issue. So whereas I think we're unlikely to rebuild a mass movement of the 80s, I do see potential for um, us joining with others who share our views about a safer and more secure and more just world. I think, I think we're right for that now. So I know um, there was a question from Morgan and I think we have time for one more question. Hi, okay, I'm on the road, but I, I just wanted to, I agree with everything Emma said. I think we need to make this uh, a human issue, right? because this is really about harm reduction. And, and Emma, as you pointed out, the spectrum of violence, right? Like violence starts with tiny things like microaggressions and then domestic abuse or even community violence all the way up to the ultimate manifestation of nuclear detonation, which is extremely violent. And, and I, I just wanna tie that back to the nuclear energy um, idea that that's a, a, a viable solution to the climate crisis because it's just exchanging one harmful energy source for another. Because if you're thinking about things that get us to uh, more future, right? More generations of humans, more prosperous, like a better future, you have to take into account the non-proliferation, the risks of proliferation, pardon me, associated with spent fuel and, and the problem with spent fuel, which is it outlasts many, many generations of humans um, and it's poisonous, hazardous waste that we're, we would be creating in mass. So I think thinking about it from the business perspective uh, makes more sense. And, and there's a lot of support for this. I would encourage you guys to look at the drawdown project, which makes the argument that we can draw down climate out of the atmosphere without resulting, resorting to, pardon me, resorting to um, nuclear energy um, because the investment in infrastructure for green energy uh, is is probably not too different. It's extremely expensive and resource intensive to build a nuclear um, reactor. But I think the, the long-term benefits of going with renewables in terms of thinking many generations down the line are um, much better than building sort of another, I feel like this field is plagued by Band-Aid solutions for all different reasons, right? But we, we, we go for that incremental change rather than going for the big change, which is to say, we could get a better future if we just make better decisions now and they're gonna be hard, but I think it's possible. So I just wanna see, um, Emma, what you think, uh, what, what both of you guys think about that, like in, in terms of getting a better future for everyone, like is nuclear energy the right thing to do? And, and can we tie these narratives effectively to um, nuclear risk reduction? Well, I guess I would just say that, uh, you know, if this turns out to be a, a, a sort of an accountant's problem, I mean, whether or not the, whether or not an investment in nuclear is, is viable and can help to, uh, to the extent that nuclear can get us closer to where we have, you have to understand, we're, we're really in a, a ticking clock situation with climate. We, we may already have passed the point of no return with climate. Uh, the point of no return. We don't know whether we have or whether we haven't yet, but in there are a lot of scientists who think that it, it's, it's very, very late in the game. I would say that, that that's a consensus view. So um, if there's a way to make uh, nuclear energy viable from a, from a, a cost accounting point of view, I, I, I can't understand any, I really can't understand the argument against it uh, because we are, 
because of the because of the alternative. I mean, um, so I don't want to flog that point. I've made it before. So um, my colleague Sarah is the most prompt person I know. Like seriously, and um, it's five thirty. And I think, David, you've left us with, I, when we were speaking at the beginning of this, I said, I think there's a, a whole set of, of secondary conversations that, that are on the launch pad here provoked by this conversation today. So I, I would like to say thank you to Emma and David for sharing their insights and expertise and thanking all of you for joining us today. And um, we're all on the hook to circle back maybe in the fall for another set of uh, conversations if you're all game. And uh, Sarah, I, are you still with us? I'm still with you only just, but yes, thank you so much, Emma and David for your wonderful insights. And of course, to everyone for showing up and for asking such really great questions. Um, so yeah, stay tuned. Right, as Lisa said, we'll probably have a series of follow-up conversations about this. So thank you all so much. Enjoy the rest of your evenings, Emma, the day for you. And we look forward to seeing you all very soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all very much. Bye. Yes, thank you. Thank you.